I would like to start with saying that I am more from a communication studies background, which means that I am, um, as you already said, um, very much interested in communication and, of course, uh, in communication that is related to certain public spheres in which this communication is um, um, present, is uh, shared, is um, where lots of um, topics and memories and um, all these aspects are negotiated among people. Um, and so I would say I have uh, three perspectives that I um, am trying to research and that are important for my perspectives, um, which are, first of all, that, um, of course, as most of us, I am interested in what people do with the past, and on the other hand, what the past does with people. Um, and this idea of doing, I guess um, all of you recognize that, is um, grounded in a, a practical um, or in a, in a perspective of practices, especially communicative practices, and especially when it comes to the past, um, it's of course about mnemonic practices. So, um, additionally to that, um, media, of course, um, are the second large area which is um, important when we want to look at how people do actually engage with the past these days. And um, so I'm also interested in, of course, what people do with media and vice versa, what media also do with people because the interesting um, relationship between those um, two is, for me, how people are integrating media in their everyday life and how their um, engagement in the past then resonates in their everyday life. And finally, um, this is not an isolated um, area or an isolated way of living, of course, in which uh, everybody is um, centered or only interested in their own life world, but also, of course, they are connected to society. So the question also is how people's doing, so how they engage in the past with media um, affects society um, and vice versa again, how society and how people are communicating in this society and in these publics also affects what people are doing. Um, I, when I started with my dissertation, one of the big problems I, um, I faced is that we have in memory studies some, um, some concepts about um, how memory is working. We have the famous Asman concept of communicative and cultural memory. And in these concepts, you often find um, quite hidden, but they are there, um, ideas of the public sphere. So um, the family as a realm in which uh, people are communicating their memories is one of these uh, realms um, in which we have a public. And we also have mass media, for example, also a public sphere where you could argue that you can um, locate the um, cultural memory in. So coming from this perspective, I was wondering if we can combine these two, uh, find uh, models of public sphere and on the other hand, um, memory studies um, um, approaches to uh, memory and um, see where they overlap. And of course, um, we are not in a world anymore where we only have the mass media public sphere um, that is concerned with, uh, I don't know, newspapers and television, but we live in um, what I would like to call a hybrid memory culture in which different types of media and, of course, uh, the internet and the digital public spheres uh, become more and more important and introduce new, um, new ways of communicating, especially through mnemonic practices, um, bottom up. So we have the mass media public sphere on which we uh, know um, communic um, cultural memory is negotiated. We have journalists, we have politicians, and so on. We have institutions that are interested in uh, certain narratives of the past, um, but they did not really allow a lot of contribution of memory from the bottom-up perspective, um, mostly only if they wanted to int integrate them themselves. So, with the digital public sphere, meaning um, uh, social media, of course, um, blogs, uh, forums, um, there is a lot of um, possibility to introduce memories um, there, bottom up, live world memories that maybe before did not really um, enter public spheres at all. So, coming from this perspective, um, I think it is quite interesting to 
um, investigate how this changed our idea of memory and how uh, people were able to connect through these, um, through these pathways that they were um, taking into the digital public sphere. Um, that means we have um, effective discourses, we have um, the question of the private and personal memory entering this um, digital public sphere um, that also um, often brings in the factor of emotion and that there is cultural production that means um, things like creating memes and of course every written text and every post is some sort of production of um, communication. So there is a lot happening and I was very much interested in um, why exactly people are um, engaging in this kind of um, discourses and uh, production of cultural um, uh, of, of memory and um, cultural production in these spheres. And um, one of the aspects that I um, mostly highlight in my dissertation is that um, it is a lot about coping with change especially when we are interested in nostalgia, and I will go into that um, a little bit more uh, later on. So, um, when we zoom in to this um, digital public sphere, of course, there's a lot of uh, different um, ways to communicate, there's a lot of uh, different types of content, and um, I would like to focus a little bit more on social network sites and uh, digital archives and how they overlap, um, or how uh, in social network sites uh, people make use of digital archives. So this is uh, kind of the uh, background I wanted to give you to understand a little bit better um, where I'm coming from and um, why I'm thinking about the question of public uh, spheres um, that much. So um, if, we, if we look at, for example, Facebook, um, we see that they are trying to um, highlight this idea of uh, relationships and bringing people together. Um, so there's this uh, quote, um, where um, Tamara, I have no idea how to pronounce her name, Hervenek, probably. Um, she said, um, there is a magnetic relationship between music and community building. We are excited to bring that to life on Facebook. Um, and this shows that they uh, pretty much know about, of course, um, the um, effective dimension of uh, music and how important it is for many people. And, this in relationship to, you, to YouTube as well, um, of course one of the, or, or the most famous platform um, um, regarding uh, music videos and how people are um, listening to music today. And um, as of January 2020, 93% uh, of the most watched videos were, were music videos. And what I found in my empirical studies is that um, these two are quite strongly linked uh, when we look at um, how people share music, how they debate and talk about music, and how they connect with each other. Um, before I go more into detail, um, I would like to highlight that, of course, um, many of you know that, uh, music has a certain important dimensions for people, and that the this is the foundation um, of why music is actually such a strong element in building connections online and um, being nostalgic, finding uh, generational overlaps and discussing all these topics related to memory and the past online. So of course it is important for socialization and identity building, so aspects that um, are important for our uh, biography and that we often try to remember when we engage in music or talk about music with others. Um, Yankee said that hearing music associated with our past often evokes a strong feeling of knowing. Um, for me, important in this sentence is uh, the feeling once again, that um, we have this connection to um, an idea of ourselves. Um, we have this idea about continuity, about who we are. So there is a lot of um, important stuff um, going on with music when we remember it. Um, then again, there is this other dimension of parasocial relationships, meaning that it is not only the music, but when fandom comes into play, there is this relationship with musicians and bands and um, the whole um, universe around music. 
And that is something that um, people, especially fans, um, share, of course, strongly. Um, Bolin said that uh, this passionate relationship to stars, genres, and even technologies, one could argue, becomes defining for the experience of certain generations. So uh, sharing this love uh, for a certain artist, for example, is something that um, is important for many people from the same uh, generation, of course not Uh, usually not the whole generation, but a certain type of fan um, living um, at a certain time. And this brings us um, to the aspect of generational uh, collectivization, meaning that, of course, this idea of being in the same generation, uh, sharing memories of a certain time, uh, is something that um, connects people very strongly. And we can find um, examples for this Uh, on Facebook, um, many examples of this. And Van Dyck, um, I think this is also not very surprising, said that uh, shared listening, exchanging records, uh, recorded songs, and talking about music creates a sense of belonging and connect a person's sense of self to a larger community and generation, basically summarizing um, the arguments I just made. Um, and I would always argue that um, music with, um, with this uh, strong emotional connection we have to it um, has at the same time um, or is a perfect match for nostalgia at the same time. Because um, if we look at nostalgia, especially in these discourses online, um, where, they, where it is not only an individual a part of myself um, to be nostalgic about something, but where I am um, in a discourse about the past and um, share my feelings with others, um, we often see that there is a constructive of a collective emotion, and I would argue at the same time um, this equals a construction of collective nostalgia. So. Um, If we look at uh, what Sheva and Sal uh, Salmela said, uh, collective emotions do something to groups and individuals. They may urge people to collective actions, promote solidarity and coercion, as well as demarcation and exclusion. So this idea of um, being part of a certain group um, always comes with the opposite of it, um, meaning that others do not belong to it. Uh, we can um, find boundaries, we can um, negotiate where we are uh, in time, where we are considering um, other people um, and, of course, also um, other music genres and so on. So there is a lot of um, negotiation where the position of a group um, is and how this group might feel. And um, I think it is, um, it is, of course, not that the group as an um, entity has an emotion, but the individuals um, talking about how they feel uh, can align and um, share a certain type of emotion. And this is why Gibbard is talking about a joint commitment to a certain type of emotion that um, one might collectively um, create, feel together, and um, build a community on. Um, this is, of course, then reinforced by the mediated communication within a group and uh, within a group that is active in a certain public. Uh, so talking about how we feel um, is something that um, is part of this uh, joint commitment. And so. I would argue too um, that we look back at uh, the certain, um, the different levels of uh, publics that I was talking about. That this idea to be um, in, um, to have these individual memories and um, these individual emotions is only one side of the coin, and that this. Um, mnemonic practices that we engage in in uh, certain online public spheres um, and groups um, helps us to share these emotions and um, evaluate, um, um, how do you say it? Well, um, to, to create something that is uh, more of this individual feeling, but to know I can relate to others who share these emotions and um, are nostalgic, for example, for the same things. Um, what I did then was to look at um, these online communities as publics of collective remembering and um, looking at how people are sharing their pasts among each other, how they uh, talk about it and um, how they share um, 
yeah, share this generational experience actually that they uh, refer to when they talk about music. Um, I just picked one of the groups I was looking at because I did um, research on uh, several groups. Some were um, focusing on uh, generations. Um, they called themselves something like uh, we are the kids of the 80s, something like that. So not specifically about music, but of course there was also a lot of music in these groups. But I also looked at one group um, that was uh, uh, specifically interested in music, so music memories of the 60s to the 90s. As you can see, um, this idea of generations is, um, while it is there, it is very broad. So you don't have the Facebook groups of the 60s and one of the 70s and one of the 80s. You have a group from the 60s to the 90s. Um, and I will show you later um, why that is and um, why it's not the 2000s, for example. Um, but as you can see um, here in the, in the chart, um, the links they are sharing in this group are mostly YouTube links. Um, and that is, of course, because um, YouTube is the biggest digital archive um, regarding music from this time that uh, can be easily shared. And um, so here we have this relationship between this digital archive that people have access to and they can post the links in Facebook. Um, and uh, this is why there are a lot of posts. Uh, as you can see, the, this group had around um, 8,000 members um, and 86,000 links from YouTube were posted in this group in one year. That means 240 links per day. Um, so you can imagine that um, this group, for example, was mostly used to share music. Um, of course, lots of reposts um, were there all the time. Um, but um, it was a platform to get in touch with music, um, to be reminded and to remind others of the shared music of the past. And it was actually not the group that, um, where, where people were talking and sharing uh, their memories um, that much compared to the generational groups. It was mainly about music even though there was some discussion, I would show you, uh, but um, compared to, the, to these other groups, it was more a, a sharing group than a, a discussion group. Um, yeah. So in this group description, I, I think that um, this highlights to everybody who grew up in the glorious 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, you're welcome to post your favorite music, what you liked during these four decades. And um, I would like to present um, some, of the, some of the things people shared there. Um, as I said, it was comparably, um, uh, compared to the other groups, not as much, but still, of course, people were discussing and talking about their past. Um, and, they, um, and this is where I think is the, is the interesting connection between these levels of memories and levels of publics that People, of course, um, connected their individual um, memories from their life words, from their own pasts, with um, this music that others can also relate to. And of course, these memories are not as unique as the individual might think, because of, uh, in your youth, I guess, um, everybody had these experiences of uh, first love, first relationship, first kiss, and so on. So as you can see, um, these quotes, the first two, uh, 1975, a school trip to Bad Münster Eifel. I was 13 and listened to ABBA only in private. Officially, one had to be a sweet fan and you had to know about Bay City Rollers as well to have luck with the girls. What a crazy time. <coughs> and the other one, memories of my youth. Even though the first girlfriend's name was not Canida but Cordula, she left, but the song and the memory stayed. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Um, but... In general, uh, of course, all these um, songs that were shared there uh, triggered um, lots of memories. Uh, today, I immediately listened to several songs that memories were triggered, and it is uh, decades of musical memory. So, of course, they, um, and that is something that, um, uh, the first explanation why there is such a long, um, or there are these four decades in there, because um, when you, 
started your, or when you were in your youth um, in the 60s, you, um, you of course experienced all these uh, decades after as well. Um, but when you were uh, in your youth in the 80s, you can also participate, um, but only have uh, like two, um, two decades to contribute. But still you are um, in this group that could, um, where you can communicate and uh, talk with others. Of course. And um, what I also found in this group, but also in others, is of course a, a connection to uh, bigger events that um, often um, were important for a whole generation um, or a whole country at that point. Um, so on the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall, I bought two hi fi speakers that I connected to this recorder. That was the right sound. So interestingly, these, um, these very memorable um, phases or uh, events in time um, are also used to, uh, to show to others um, that we have a commonality, that we all experience the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, have a reference, and then um, at the same time try to connect the personal experiences with it. Um, of course, um, as it is usual in the case, um, music fans think they are music connoisseurs uh, in a changing world, um, meaning that, of course, there, and that is this nostalgic notion that we often find um, that there is criticism how music changed and uh, that it was better in the past. So um, one said, uh, one of my all-time favorite songs, I posted it for my circle of friends. Unfortunately, they are musical philistines, um, meaning that they don't appreciate this kind of music. And so she turned to um, this group. And this is something we often find um, if people do not find people in their uh, friends, uh, circle of friends which share an interest, share uh, uh, some type of, uh, um, yeah, some type of um, uh, musical um, uh, appreciation, then you can find others on the internet, of course, um, that do. So this is why we find um, a lot, actually a lot of these posts where they just celebrate their time. So the good old 80s, at least this was music. Um, these were songs you could sing to them and the old classics were better, weren't they? So this is something I guess um, you can find in almost every group that is kind of nostalgic about something. And um, technology is also always uh, an issue in these groups. So um, here one comment, he hit the highest notes at a time that one really had to sing. Not like today, uh, cue technology. So um, this type of criticism um, is something that is quite, um, quite usual. And Finally, I would like to um, talk a little bit more about the intergenerational community building because on one hand we see that um, these members in these groups are very much interested in having good relationships, building relationships and uh, being friends with each other and um, being nice to each other. We see this, uh, thank you very much for admitting to me to this group. This is exactly my world. I would be very happy to establish new contact, uh, contacts. Um, they say good night and good morning a lot. And um, they try to help each other. So there is this, of course, very uh, social and collaborative way of engaging in the past and um, sharing this um, this emotions, uh, of course, as well, about um, the time they share. But um, now there's the cut, there's the demarcation. Um, they, on one hand, have this broad um, four decades, but on the other hand, at some point, it, it stops. And this is the 2000s. And when somebody who does not follow the rules of this group that has established that it is um, these four decades, um, then something like this happens. Um, where somebody wrote, Krista, this is about my alleged double standards of liking songs from the decade of the 2000s. So uh, she posted something and uh, the, the rest of them didn't like it. And um, then they tried to come and say, uh, folks, don't you understand that we simply want to watch, listen to and share good old music. Please do not quarrel. Do not destroy the wonderful memories that brought us here together, the music. Uh, um, it would be a shame. So I think that um, 
to sum this up, um, it is quite interesting to see how this relationship between um, memory that is based in, or, or let's say, the, the, this type of music that is circulating, of course, in certain publics that we can all have access to in these digital archives, um, are always related to this individual experience of a time that is at the same time relatable for many people, that is used to connect, that is used to build communities, and that helps, um, helps a certain um, Let's say uh, that people have a certain idea of generation. It is not really that um, it is a clear-cut generational um, group, but it also plays with this idea in, already in the title of certain generations and certain decades that you have to experience. So in my conclusion, I would like to uh, go back to the slide from the beginning and say that um, the question of what people do with the past is that in this case they share these individual pasts and uh, related to the collective pasts that um, these people have um, via the music they love. Um, of course they experience um, joy, nostalgia and also coping with change, uh, discussing what has changed and um, why certain things in the past were more comforting, comforting or uh, better, something we usually see with uh, this type of nostalgia. Um, what do people do with the media? Well, they um, share the past across certain publics using digital archives. Um, I am still very much interested in how far up the ladder this kind of memory can go, meaning that the question is, uh, do journalists pick it up? Um, does it actually reach this mass media public sphere? Um, does it get to a broader audience? Uh, well, because these are questions um, as well about resources and power relations and um, narratives and hegemony. And it would be interesting to see how much of a, let's say, democratization of memory is in there. Um, and unfortunately, I'm afraid, not as much as I would like to, uh, to see it. So, of course, what do media do with the people? Well, they trigger communication, um, mnemonic practices, um, and it is integrated into people's everyday life, and even more so um, with smartphones, of course, where you can go into these groups, be part of, the, um, of this community on a day-to-day -day basis, um, Get, um, get new posts um, on your uh, smartphone and so on. So this is something that is very much integrated in your um, everyday life. And finally, of course, the question of uh, what does this type of memory uh, work and uh, mnemonic practices actually do with society? And I would say that, um, of course, social interaction per se is something that um, is positive as long as it does not um, result in uh, hate posts and um, uh, cyber mobbing or stuff like that. Um, but um, in these cases, people are actually trying to engage in something they love and share it with others. So I guess this is quite positive. And of course, there's a negotiation of the past. Um, is this something we uh, we uh, miss? Is it something we relate to? Um, how can we um, bring bring certain aspects of it to the present, all these negotiations about what the past actually means and how it is related to the present, uh, is related to change. Um, these are very interesting perspectives that we find in these groups. And finally, how does society affect these peoples and their doing? I would say that, of course, being confronted with others' experiences, we see that um, this experience of change is not something that we experience as individuals, but as a society, as certain groups um, that are then nostalgic about the past. So it is, I think, a very important um, element of coping with change to have these publics in which people can um, negotiate uh, the past and the present and um, in which certain narratives about the past can be uh, shared or constructed.